Here we are again with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, for another discussion about various things. Various things. Food. <laughs> gourmet kind of stuff. Yeah. Hey, yeah. John, I know you are a you are a big wine um, connoisseur, and I wanted to ask you about the wine industry because it seems to me things have been changing. Uh, what is what's actually happening? Well, you should especially be concerned in California because it's such a major, major uh, industry out there, and that one is that which is kind of the victim of its own success. And to a certain extent, that's true of of all wine uh, in the world. Uh, so that wine sales overall are probably going up in terms of just the amount of wine that's being purchased in the world. But the market has been very, very splintered. And there are disturbing signs that the most important segment of wine drinkers, i.e. Gen X and whatever the generation is after Gen X, I don't even know what these things mean, uh, millennials and, and so forth, that they are not drinking their share of wine and that young people do not have the interest in wine, that the older segment <coughs> uh, of wine drinkers, i.e. us, uh, are. We are doing our part. We, over the age of uh, 40 and 50, um, we've discovered the pleasures of wine uh, to a certain extent. And whereas the younger generation, <clears throat> they do not seem to be um, particularly interested in either beginning or drinking a lot of it or moving up to the next level. Um, and it's very disturbing uh, as a result. Um, it should be said that there's more wine being pumped out uh, in the world today than ever before. Because remember that <clears throat> even 20 years ago, uh, wines out of Chile, uh, Brazil, um, the South American countries, uh, South Africa always made wine, was never very particularly important. Now the Eastern Bloc countries, the Czech Republic, um, uh, Georgia in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, all of these uh, places, uh, New Zealand, certainly Australia, um, are pumping out enormous amounts of wine into the pi pipeline um, because back 30, 40 years ago, the success of California wines and the intrusion into the market of better Italian wines uh, made it kind of a sure thing that this was going to rise and rise and rise. Um, and what we saw back then was that we, the people who are now in our, in the prime of uh, geezership, um, we who are in our 1670s, remember we were the people who started back in the, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, getting away from Riuniti on ice so nice and uh, Boone's Farm apple wine, <laughs> moving up to um, better wines. First. Um, like Bola Suave and Santa Margherita Pinot Grigio, because these Italian wines were coming in. And we we graduated from Chateau Martin French wines to um, the French wines that were coming in from Bordeaux and Burgundy and Alsace and so forth. Um, and we were becoming slightly connoisseurs uh, in so far as the interest in wine pushed by the media um, was such that this was a new thing, um, a thing that actually showed that you were pretty cool. Um, and bottle of wine, fruit of the vine, when you're going to let me get sober, you know, uh, songs like that. Um, have some Madeira Madeira, um, strawberry wine, Kingston Trio sang about. So these were, while you and I, John, and I assume Art, were at the Beachmont Lounge across from Iona College uh, drinking lots and lots of beer, uh, whereas uh, the girls were drinking uh, rum and coke. Um, by the time we got to college, we were moving more towards wine, tasting it out and so forth. Okay, so add to all that the fact that California wines, which were known uh, for, you know, Carlo Rossi jug wines and uh, Thunderbird and stuff like that. Uh, California wines just started to boom because they got so much better, so much faster. And in Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley specifically, and then Mendocino and elsewhere, um, not only could they could produce more or as much as they wanted to, but became very prestigious to do so, so that 
today, you can't even touch vineyard land in Napa Valley and the better parts of Napa Valley for under three, four hundred thousand dollars an acre. That's that's without grapes on it. Um, then you rip them all out, then you put them back in, then you wait for them to grow. But up until now, there has been uh, a great interest uh, and revival of California wines. And consequently, Australia say, why couldn't we do the same thing? And New Zealand, we produce, produce wine up here. So the market has been flooded and flooded and flooded. In fact, in Europe, they have a thing called the Lake of Alcohol. And this is all the traditional wine that has been produced of rather inferior quality uh, over the years, which because there's such a surplus and because the EU supports us, this stuff is dumped, it was made into just alcohol, um, you, know, you know, like, like not, not, not the isopropyl alcohol, but you could turn it into brandy and cheap brandy. But that's where these wines are going. So you add to this the fact that now people are drinking the italian young people are drinking less the french people are drinking less um the french really do drink la coca-cola and the uh the italians do too um they like soft drinks more than ever and they're drinking a lot more beer so that wine which was once the staple and it still is the staple in france and italy uh, for a good meal, uh, it's likely that if you were in Rome, Trattoria, or in Florence, you'd see 10 uh, Italian kids sitting together and they'd be having pizza and Coca-Cola or a beer, the same as if you stuck that exact same group and stuck them in Southern California, uh, that's what they would be doing too. Um, why this is, is um, I really can't explain. Um, Maybe it is a question of they don't want to drink their father's and grandfather's preferred beverage. But what I do know is that the California wine industry uh, grew and grew and grew on the basis of having finer quality wines, which everybody sought it to overprice. So when you think of a Chardonnay, and a good Chardonnay can be had for... 15 to 20 dollars which is still a lot of money for anybody to buy a bottle of wine over dinner um there are vintners out there in california who think well we can have 70 80 90 dollar bottles of chardonnay um well that's, that's that's a tough sell um there are burgundies in france that uh sell for over three thousand dollars a bottle when they are released and in a restaurant they'd be nine thousand dollars a bottle but uh, oddly enough those those wines, because they are a very small quantity, do tend to sell. And as we've spoken about um, on this show before, uh, Scotch, whiskey, and bourbon have been raising their prices to be these special barrel-aged uh, uh, spirits. And there, there are some bourbons on the market now going for six and $7,000 a bottle. They become cult wines. But in the overall industry, I mean, how many bottles are we talking about? So a lot of it has been priced out of the market because for young people to even say, let's have a bottle of wine tonight for dinner, how much are we going to spend? Well, traditionally, they've been spending 5 to $10. Now they'll go 10 to $12. But above that $12 limit um, is, uh, is a, difficult, uh, a, a difficult rung to, to climb. So what is the industry doing about it? Um, one thing, and I have an interview in my virtual gourmet coming out about this um, with uh, a person who is a consultant for wineries. <clears throat> They're trying to take the stigma of wine from being overly connoisseurship, uh, the kinds of language that is used to describe wines by the media is counterproductive. Labels that you don't even know exactly what this wine is, is counterproductive. They're also trying to take away uh, the, uh, not take away, but uh, start going from corks, which, let's find, frankly, I break corks. <laughs> Everybody snaps off corks. Um, they're not the most easy opener in the world. And that since there's nothing wrong with screw caps, but are perceived as being cheap, chintzy, um, but the industry has to move uh, that way too. And last but not least, um, boxes and um, cans. Uh, the fact of the matter is 
especially for a wine that's under $20. Wines are going to taste exactly the same out of a can or a, a box as it would out of a bottle. The bottle adds nothing to the wine. You could stick it, stick it in a, a can and leave it there for five years right next to a bottle of wine, and each is either going to get better or not get better at all. So um, it's just the romance of the bottle, which I like, and the, the silly romance of the cork, which I do not like and have never liked, uh, are things that are holding a lot of people back. So there you have it. It's, um, it's a world of rising expectations, but the expectations for the wine industry are not that high. Oh, I, I should mention that China, whose economy was booming and there was a lot of interest in wine, is now crashing. And um, even the most expensive wines, which the Komazas of China used to order, uh, they have been cut back severely. So uh, it's a slippery slope. Well, you know, I, I have to uh, say, John, that um, uh, to maybe feed a little hope into uh, uh, what otherwise is a, uh, and you're not a gloomy guy at all. You're extremely upbeat. But I have uh, three kids who are uh, in their, you know, between 40 and early 50s. Uh, so they would they would qualify as that next generation, not your your fathers or grandfathers or whatever. And uh, we live in Southern California. Two of them live near me. And um, a, a big area for wine and wine tasting is uh, a place called Temecula. Uh, and uh, to me, that always seemed like a, just a hot, dry place. But apparently, they have developed quite a following. But the interesting thing is that. They some of the wineries have placed little stores, little tasting bars, uh, and uh, one of them that my daughter belongs to has actually three of them within about thirty miles of each other, just here in Southern California, and they seem to be growing in popularity. So this may be regional, this may just be uh, some one-offs. And my other daughter, who lives up in San Francisco, uh, has uh, always uh, uh, frequented. Uh, uh, wineries in um, Napa and belonged to a club there. I don't know whether she still does. And she used to get regular, uh, either she would pick up or they would ship in uh, uh, things to her. And they, so they've acquired a taste for it. So it may be, they may be bucking the trend, <clears throat> but. Wine tourism, especially in beautiful, beautiful areas like California's wine country has, um, and the Rhine River and all, but wine tourism uh, is booming. But mm -hmm. if you added all of that up, if you took every person who uh, visited a winery and bought some wine, uh, it's a significant amount. But if you got rid of it all tomorrow, it really wouldn't dent worldwide sales. Hmm. Well, John, all I can say is I still want my wine in a bottle. I prefer the bottle myself, although they do break. They do fall out of your wine shelves. I've had it happen, you know. Oh, there goes the 1939 Lafitte. You know, it's it's <laughs> in a can. In a Pop can. It it have... Thanks, John. My pleasure. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.